on the back flap. Harold Osmond's passion for auto racing history surfaced while performing his graduate thesis. The result was published as the Racing Cult Classic, Where They Race. Harold, okay, this is 1999, but I'm going to keep reading. Harold is a stay-at-home father of two, works as a writer and karate instructor in the evening, and can be seen at Southern California Automotive Events with his 1951 Chevy Spec truck. So, 1999. And so this is a copy that Harold graciously provided to the Fever Center of, I believe this is your second book? Yes. And, um, so this is, the first book, Where They Race, the cult classic, is now out of print, but there's a DVD documentary mm -hmm. uh, uh, similar from 2013. And then Harold also has a third book, Saga Speedway Scrapbook. And Harold also has appearances on various shows, such as Phil Hauser, Adam Carolla, and also with Jay Reynolds. And so I'm happy to introduce Harold Osmond. I appreciate you guys spending your lunch <laughs> hour with me. I'm kind of honored and humbled to be here today because uh, it was a chance meeting that even got me over here in the first place uh, a few months ago when I met the director outside of uh, a restaurant downtown. Right. At the turn of the century, uh, about 19 teens through 1920s, the single biggest professional sport in America was auto racing. Right? There was no radio, no television, anything of that nature. It was auto racing. And it was, and it makes sense because that's when the automobile first came about and people were interested in it. A lot of people hadn't even seen a car. So to come out and see one racing and competing and doing its thing, it was a big deal. Right? People all across the country were doing it and they were drawn to it. These are the books that they alluded to. Um, where they race started as my graduate thesis. I have a master's degree in geography, land use planning, at from Cal State Northridge, from 1996, I think is when that came around. <coughs> now I took that, converted the format, whatever else, and turned it into an actual book, which became Where They Race, and then I expanded on it later because I managed to sell 10,000 copies of my graduate thesis, and it became Where They Race Flat Two. I got to expand it out. Right. The gist of the thesis was looking at where a racetrack was, what's there today, and what effect a racetrack had on future land use. So even though it's where they raced, it's not about auto racing. And we're not going to talk about auto racing today. We're going to talk about where and why. Right? So I looked at where the racetracks were, what's there today. If you think of a gas station, for instance, you can't just make flat with a gas station and put up a house. Right? You have zoning changes, you have to take up fuel tanks, all these sorts of things. So what happens with old racetracks? Well, the short answer to the question is, the effect is none. Right? There's no effect. Okay? The more fun answer is, more auto racing has taken place in Southern California than any other place in the world. From 1903 up to the current time, we have 174 different official racetracks in Southern California. Right? And this isn't Uncle Bob's Back 40 and Jefferson Avenue and things like this. These are official racing venues. Well, Santa Monica, like so many other places out here, really needed attention. They needed to draw people to the area. There's no natural resources in Southern California. There's no, none of the traditional natural resources, such as timber, mining, there's no wonderful port, anything of this nature to bring people out here. So what did we have? We had space and we had weather. Well, everybody has space and weather. So how do you get people to come to Santa Monica? That was the, the problem for Santa Monica and all the other little towns and cities that had grown up in Southern California in this time period. We're about 1900 up to about 1920, give or take. If you were standing on the hill above uh, Santa Monica Canyon looking north, this would have been your view up to about 1880, give or take. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing here. There's lots of physical beauty, the beach, that sort of thing, but there are no resources. You can't live there. There's no settlements. There's no roads. And if there was a road, it wouldn't go anywhere. So that's really what they were up against. So they decided to hold the races. Here's an aerial map that shows you where the racetrack was. I hired the best looking guy I could to come out and show us. That's the 405. Here's the 10 freeway. And then of course the yellow line outlines where the course was. 
That's Wilshire Boulevard, which is still there today. That's the Veterans Center, which was the old soldier's home. San Vicente, come through the S-curve, back to Ocean. The starting line for this course was at Ocean in Montana. Well, we're going to start our discussion a little bit more talking about Santa Monica itself, down here in this corner. This is the McClure Tunnel, the business end of the McClure Tunnel that comes out onto ACA. In the background is the Arcadia Hotel. And they needed, I found this, 1880s Edison footage of train going through the McClure Tunnel. So if you drive down the 10 freeway, go into Santa Monica, and you transition on the PCH, this is where you drive. This is from the 1880s, which is just wonderful. And did you see the guys, you know, jumping out of the way and holding it? I know it's a little fuzzy and jumps around, and that sort of thing. It's good fun. And the train went to the Long Wharf, which was the pier. Huntington built a train line, and it went out to the pier, which I think we've seen this guy before. He shows you, here's where the train tracks were. I don't want to walk over there and point to all this stuff anyway. So I got this guy to do it for me. There's a bridge there just behind my hand, my, my left hand there. And that spot I just circled is where Patrick's Roadhouse is. If you go out to that area today, right at the mouth of the canyon, it's a big green restaurant thing. And that was an old train building. And if you go there for breakfast, wonderful breakfast, bring a friend and share a plate. <laughs> healthy portion, but that's, so that's exactly where that location is. The train didn't go much beyond where the Long Wharf is, and that's the Long Wharf out there. I think you can figure out where that is. And there you go. 1893 to 1897. Huntington's idea was, we're going to let ships come in and dock at the pier. They can load and unload and move all their freight through Santa Monica, across what is now San Vicente, and into Los Angeles because there was no port for Los Angeles at the time. And how do you get stuck through the place? There's too much mountains and desert and everything else to the east and to the north, and there's nobody to the south. So it was very extensive. The plan didn't work. I mean, it sufficed for the short term, but it really didn't work. A superior port location was found in San Pedro, and they dredged that out and developed that, and so this pretty much went away. Uh, from this view, off to the right would be Santa Monica Canyon, and to the left is Potrero Canyon, and from your standard Google view, there we are again. All right? So that worked reasonably well, but not a caught on to it. Huntington thought he would have a monopoly on it, and so they pretty much shut that down, which was another reason he went to San Diego. So we come back to the McClure Tunnel, and that's the Arcadia Hotel in the background. This was another way that Santa Monica tried to attract people to the area. They built this wonderful hotel. Nobody came. Why not? Well, you're on the cliff, and you got to go to the beach. You got to go down, out do your beach thing, come back. Now you have to climb back up the cliff. In the same time period, Venice and Ocean Park, just to the south, at Sea Level, and Abbott Kinney was over there digging the canals. They had different piers, different um, entertainment things going on over there. So people would go there because it's easier, and they would do that rather than come to Santa Monica. The reputation of Santa Monica at this time, lots of bar rooms, um, there was a dusty cow town, a lot of brothels and everything else. It had a pretty bad reputation at the time. Right? So notice it's five stories tall, lots of activities going on as we rotate around. They had this wooden roller coaster thing that was really not so much a thrill ride as it was a way to go out to a fleet platform and give you some more things to look at while you're at the Arcadia Hotel. And if we rotate again, We'll come around to the street side view. And there we go. The wonderful Arcadia Hotel. Notice there's train tracks that run right across in front. Um, Pacific Electric cars could come out. In this time period, there were no cars really in Los Angeles to speak of. So you had to take the horse and buggy or you take the train to get out to places. And there was very remote, I guess 15 to 20 miles from downtown Los Angeles where most people live out to Santa Monica which was a vacation site more than anything else. Another thing that comes up with this, and you, some of you guys will appreciate it as researchers, I would find pictures of the Arcadia Hotel and I would say, I know what the Arcadia Hotel looks like, this isn't it. I go, wait a minute, this is it, it says so right on the, what, but no, the Arcadia Hotel is five stories tall. This is only three stories tall. Wait a minute. And some guys have a light bulb, I have a candle, and it finally lit. And it dawned on me that 
when you see the pictures of the hotel from a different angle, part of it goes down the cliff, this part doesn't show the cliff. So there's two stories below this that you can't see. So as a researcher, I finally dawned on what I was looking at, because the building all looked right, but this one's taller, this one's shorter. But that, and they had to solve that problem. <laughs> Another thing that happened at the Arcadia Hotel in 1903, <coughs> Griffith Jenkins Griffith of Griffith Park fame. 1903, September, he and his wife were staying at the hotel. He was a temperance guy in public, and in private, he would drink himself stupid. Well, he drank mm -hmm. himself stupid one night, shot his wife, shot her in the head. She moved at the last possible moment, got caught, just grazed her eye. She survived, rolled across the floor, jumped out the window, fell, landed on the uh, awning down below, broke her shoulder, <coughs> survived, got through it all. Right? So, they caught up to him. He used the Twinkie defense, alcohol and sanity. Sent him off to San Quentin for three years. When he got out, he tried to reestablish his uh, reputation and his name. And this is how we got the uh, Greek theater. Right? He had already donated most of us to the land and the parkland and all that sort of thing. But, so it was the first real celebrity trial in Los Angeles and it all came from the, the hotel. His wife forgave him, by the way. And, you know, my wife shoots me in the eye. She's done for. <laughs> <laughs> um, a little brighter than that, hopefully. So that's some background on Santa Monica history. Here we go. Wide view. First auto race, first official auto race in Los Angeles. Took place here. We are here. 1903. Agricultural Park. It was a one mile horse track out here. You can still see the horse track. This picture is from 1928. The Coliseum is under construction. You can see that obviously there. And over on this side, I'm going to draw a nice little circle around the grandstand on the south side. It was covered grandstand as well. Mind you, it was mostly a horse track. And the Fiesta Week celebration, which amounted to the county fair, is what took place here for a number of years. It took place here. Now we do it out in Pomona. Right? But originally, it was right here. And in 1903, they staged the first automotive meet at an official competition, which was, which amounts to now, I'm telling you, <laughs> it's the first official auto race in Los Angeles, 1903, here at Agricultural Park. Yay, us! <laughs> so there's that. Just south of downtown, again, you get a nice lay of the land. And I think this guy comes back. There's the marina. We're familiar with that. And we're going to take a look at this place. <coughs> nice. The Motor Drone, Playa del Rey. This was the first wooden speedway built specifically for cars. It was 1910 to 1913. It eventually, part of the track got burned by vagrants who were hanging out out there. But it was built in the middle of the swamp anyway. About 1910 to 1913, um, the guy who designed this track was the same guy who designed and built uh, bicycle velodromes and motorcycle wooden speedways, which you could come out and they were extremely popular. But you couldn't run cars on them because cars were too heavy and they would go too fast and they would deteriorate much too quickly. So this was the first official racetrack built out of wood, specifically for cars. It was right in Playa del Rey. It was a one-mile circle, 18-degree banking, as you saw in there. The trouble they had was the cars couldn't go beyond 100 miles an hour because they would lose traction. It was steady banking all the way around, so they eventually wound up pushing up, and it got too dangerous. Plus, they didn't know really how to stage an auto race back then. It was a brand-new sport. The cars themselves were new. They didn't know how to entertain the people long enough in between events and what classification should we use, and all kinds of technical things that come into play. But the big deal was, it was located in Playa del Rey, near Venice. This is a program cover for one of the events, Thanksgiving, 1910. And it says right on there, after the races, take a trip to Venice. Why Venice? Why not Santa Monica? Well, because there's nothing in Santa Monica. Go to Venice, have a good time. They had restaurants, they had hotels, they had activities, the canals were going in, that's where all the stuff was going on. Nothing was happening in Santa Monica at this time. Mind you, the motor drone was there from 1910 to 1913. Santa Monica road races actually ran from 09 to 19. So they were realizing that we need to find a way to bring people in. 
Well, this is great artwork. It was all hand drawn by somebody, and it brings up the next question of where exactly was that track? I found the map. And you can see the circle in the middle. That's where the motor going was, right? If you see the dark lines are kind of crisscross up there. The heavy dark lines, those were train lines. And just below the circle, along one of them, you can see a little curve out thing. That's where they built a little spur track, they called it, so you could bring people in and out of the racetrack. Right? It was a one mile circle. And if you wonder where that was today, see there's ocean on my side and Bayona Lagoon. And if you go there today, look like that. There's the ocean. The marina was built in the 1960s. And the creek that runs alongside there was uh, channelized in the 1930s. And, uh, and in this shot, it looks like Culver Boulevard jogs around the motor drone. It really didn't. The motor drone was long gone by then. But if you wanted to build a bridge over it, you want to go as perpendicular as you can to make the bridge more secure and shorter. So, but it's kind of fun to think that the road has to go around the motor drone. <laughs> no, it really doesn't do that. And again, it just ran from 1910 to 1913, and it went away just because nobody really knew how to use it. Another thing that comes up, if you go out to <coughs> Venice, you'll find Speedway. And it amounts to, this is a Google view, obviously, it looks like an alley. And it essentially is today. It runs parallel to Pacific. It's closer to the ocean. And it's just Speedway. It's not Speedway Drive, Speedway Road, no, it's just Speedway. It never went through the racetrack. They never raced on Speedway. Why the name? First paved road, 1908. Real estate developers came out and they graded the road. They hard packed it, they essentially paved this road. The reason for it is that when you come out to Venice, they have your fun and whatnot. You drive in your car and it takes you an hour and a half, two hours just to get there over the rutted roads and you're bouncing along. Now you can take your nice speedster car and come out and drive it at speed on Speedway. While you're out here, did you notice this property over here would be real nice? You could move your business right out here. This, that type of thing is what it was. So it was an enticement to get people to come out and drive their cars at speed. And it's still there today, which is just fun. You know, it, again, it amounts to an alley today, but back then, the first paved road west of Los Angeles, and this is great stuff because it's still there. Hmm. We'll touch on one more thing here. You notice a lot of train tracks going in and around and all that, and that's how they moved <coughs> people back then. It was primarily the tracks were put in to move freight. Right? People were an afterthought. There were a number of train lines that were put in by real estate developers, but they were very cheap, and they were just designed to haul people out, show them the property, sell them stuff, and then they didn't worry about it. They weren't in for the long haul. So regardless of what Roger Rabbit wants to tell us, there was no big collusion to kick out the red cars or whatnot. They were just expensive, hot, and dusty, except for when they were expensive, cold, and dusty, and they just didn't last very long. It was an inefficient way to move people in Southern California, especially in that era when we were so spread out. Buses were superior in every way because you could turn left here, you could turn right there, you could go further, you could add a car, you could take away a car. You could do all of much more flexibility than the red line had. So there's that. So that's our backdrop to Santa Monica. <coughs> Auto racing. This is our buddy Barney Oldfield. He was known for having a cigar in his mouth whenever he drove. And he trying to make it out in that picture. He never lit the cigar while he was driving. He would just keep it in there and keep his teeth from mashing together because he was bouncing around on the wooden road, on, on the dirt roads rather. This is the era, as I call it, of chain drive wooden spokes and hair for helmets. They also didn't have seat belts. The reason for that is the fuel tanks were metal, and if you crashed, they would leak, and they were afraid of fire, and so they didn't want to burn. So they thought, we'll just jump clear of the car when it rolls over, and it'll be safer. Uh, okay. Here he, is making, <laughs> here he is making the corner at Dead Man's Curve, which is Ocean and Wilshire, and nobody died at Dead Man's Curve. Right? That's just the way today attracted people out. Dead Man's Curve right here to try and get people to come out to the event. Again, there's no radio, no television, no way for the word to get around except for through the newspaper. So they would write it up, Dead Man's Curve. The first racing injury <coughs> occurred at Dead Man's Curve, though, in 1909. Guys were out there practicing, came around the corner, got a little hot, slid off, hit the tree. 
guys who were up in the tree and fell. Where we learned. All right, first racing incident, <laughs> first racing injury was 1909 at Dead Man's Curve. He didn't die, he just fell out of the tree because he came around the corner a little high. And that was that. Again, remind you where we are Ocean to Wilshire and back around San Vicente. Today, along San Vicente, you have uh, Greenbelt and you have two lanes of traffic. But back then, the only road was to the south of where the Greenbelt is today. Right? And it was the old soldier's home up there at the Veterans Center. And there we go, Ocean to Montana. So about where the A in the Avenue on Ocean is, is where the start finish line is. Right? And you're going generally downhill as you're coming on Ocean. When you turn to go up Wilshire, it's a straight road, but you're going uphill. Next time you're out there, you drive up there, you'll got to kind of make a mental note and you'll notice that you are going a little bit uphill, which makes perfect sense because the water is in the ocean, not the other way. And if the land went the other way, there'd be a big lake over by UCLA. And it's not because it goes that way, so you're going uphill, which was okay. And when you come back down San Vicente, you're going downhill because you're going towards the ocean. And so you would pick up speed and go really fast going that direction, which was great fun. And people would come out and sit all around the race course. They would camp out for days to watch these events. And it was encouraged. So here, if you're in the grandstand looking across at the starting line, you notice in front of the 24 and the 11, there's two guys out there, and they're hand cranking the cars. That's how they started the cars back then. That was the technology that they had available. And so they used it. Notice also there's a um, train car in the background. That's that line that ran across the ocean and again went in front of the Arcadia Hotel. And that's how a lot of people came out to the events. They would ride the train now. Also, when they started these events, they didn't start like they do today. Everybody side by side, they come around, wave the green flag, and they take off. No, it was too smoky, too dusty, too dangerous. They didn't want to do that. Because it was, they were, they were not dumb. They were just ignorant. They didn't know it yet. They were still developing how to do all of these sorts of events. If you're on the other side of the track, over the other side of the ocean, then looking back, you can find the grandstand. You pay your money to sit in the grandstand, but you didn't have to pay money to sit around the race course. And you'd have hundreds of thousands of people, 100,000 people would come out, watch these events, and it was roughly half the population of Los Angeles County at the time would come out to watch these things. And you didn't have to pay to do that. It was great. <coughs> Wonderful stuff. Two man cars. You had a driver and a mechanician. Right? The reason you needed a mechanician, a couple of reasons. They didn't have good oil pumps or fuel pumps, so they had to keep the pressure up. Somebody's got to do that. So somebody's doing that and somebody's doing this. You get the driver doing that. These guys didn't trade off in the middle of the race or anything like this. They just, <laughs> one guy was the driver, the other guy was the me mechanician. And if the car broke down anywhere along the race course, you need somebody to help you change a tire. One of the reasons for holding an auto race was to prove the reliability of the race car in the first place. And so the idea is that it would be just you and your friend out driving the car and you should be able to fix it yourselves. So if people <coughs> and spectators came and helped you change a tire, you'd be disqualified from the race. Because we're trying to prove the reliability of your car and if you, you, know, you can't do that. So that's how that would go. If you were in the pits, it's the same as being in a garage. You can have as many guys help as you want. So the idea is you find the biggest and earliest tallest dude you can with a big long stick and have him move up the car so you can get the weight off the wheel and do all of that. And it's great fun today. You watch a race on TV and they come into the pits, <coughs> done. They change cars, they change all the tires, they did all the stuff, and it takes them four seconds. Great. These guys take about four minutes. <laughs> you know, but you would do that in the pits. And that's how that technology worked. It was wonderful. Earl Cooper, in the studs, when you signed up to race, <coughs> they would assign you a number for your car. That's something else that has changed now. Earl Cooper decided he liked number eight, so he always lobbied hard to get number eight. This particular image shows a sister to the car that's here in the collection. Right, this is an earlier version of the studs that's here, which is a great car. And you notice a couple of things here. Well, he won in 1913. And the eight steps, you notice it's also lean. And you see a lot of these pictures say lean. You know why they lean? Clearly it's just a car. How can it do that? Photographic technology. 
is what it's all about. Mm. If you think about uh, digital cameras, I have no idea how those work, but think back to the focal point shutter, open close, the old classic camera, mm. this kind of thing. Right? Prior to that, it was a focal plane shutter, which was just a slit that would drop and it would expose the film on the opposite side. The lens inverts the image. So as this thing is dropping, the first thing that gets exposed is the lower part of the car. Well, it takes X amount of milliseconds or whatever it is for that thing to drop. They got better later when they added spring to them to make them go faster. But it's exposing the film as it drops. And in that time, while this car is going 90 miles an hour, the car is moved. So you see this part here and that part there just because it takes that long for the focal plane shutter to drop and make that motion. That's why you see that. I know the italics go that way too, so I thought it was fun if it didn't invert the image, the italics would go the opposite direction and what would that do to all our writing? It's fun to play with. But that at least explains that much of it. So who were these guys? These guys would come out and drive. They were local guys mostly, chauffeurs for rich dudes who had cars who wanted to show off that his car could go faster than the other guy and my driver's better than your guy. And that's how a lot of it got started. There were no professional race drivers because there was no profession of auto racing at this point. So some of the guys like uh, Barney Oldfield that started out as a bicycle racer, and there were other guys that did that by the 1920s, they were being replaced by actual race car drivers. Uh, Joe Nacrent was one of my favorite guys just because that's a wonderful picture. That's what he raced in was that big, thick sweater, and, he, and he's got the big honking hands and the power steering is all right up here. And Peggy Pullen, I got to meet his uh, son and got to be friendly with him for a while, so he was quite a guy. These were all just general characters. Another local fella is Tetzlaff. Teddy Tetzlaff. This is terrible Teddy Tetzlaff. This image is for a uh, silent movie, Max Senate comedy, and it's a little fuzzy up there, but it's Speed Kings. And the gist of the movie is the guy wants his daughter to marry a race car driver, she doesn't want to marry that guy, so they make a compromise, okay, whoever wins the big race can marry my daughter, and off you go. But the fun part about it is, they came out and actually shot footage of the race, and you can tell the difference, here's along San Vicente, the racetrack, or the, the train tracks off to the side. Some of it is stock footage like this, they must have put it on the back of a truck and drove along and had the guys participate, much like here. And some of it is actual race footage. And you can see how much smoke is coming off of these cars and how dangerous this whole thing would have been. But it's a fascinating time, and this movie is available online if you go on and look up Speed Kings, you can find it and watch it. It's a 10 minute comedy. What well, is wonderful that they did this, and the, the movie industry was brand new as well. So nobody really knew what these people were doing out here. In a second, they'll come up and see people in the car <coughs> don't even know what's going on. Who's these crazy people over there with a the camera and jumping around doing their thing? Okay. So of course Dad <coughs> doesn't like Teddy Tetzlaff, so he sabotaged this car, pumped it full of oil or whatever he did with it. So now we have to fix the car. And here goes Cooper. Well, we have to catch him. You know, all the drama that comes into play. How do we catch the guy? What do we do? You see how big that car is? How tall the hood is on that car? So he comes off. He chases the girl around the corner, or chases the Cooper around the corner. Wow, well, there's Dead Man's Curve. Nobody died at Dead Man's Curve. Boom, boom, here we go. The race is over. Yay! There's Marty Oldfield. And watch, he's very nonchalant about, oh, yeah, there's okay, there's a camera over there, sure. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And <coughs> little Cooper, well, oh, Mr. Cooper, you won the race. That's fabulous. Oh, that's great. But you know what? Um, eh, sorry, but my heart belongs to Teddy. And so off she goes. And that's Mabel Norman. And she's one of those people that set the tone for everybody else that came after. Somebody has to be the groundbreaker that makes it possible for everyone else to survive. Like Mary Pickford and whatever else became much more famous than Mabel Norman. But Mabel Norman cut a lot of those paths that benefited everyone that came afterwards. Mm -hmm. So you don't hear too much about it. All right. A number of things went on, and this was part of the thing, part of the reason that I find this the most fascinating era in auto racing history is because they didn't know how to hold an event, they didn't know what kind of technology they had. And here we have three cars that span the era. 
1912 over on the right, you can see chain drive wooden spokes. Pair for helmets anywhere. See how tall that thing is. 900 cubic inches, four cylinder car. And what that means is you have pistons this big and they turn about 1200 RPM. Okay, car dash stuff. Think about a Mustang. You see the average Mustang out here driving around today says 5.0 on it. That's around 300 cubic inches and that's eight cylinders. As opposed to this guy, which is three times the size and only four cylinders. So they made brute force was how they did it. Okay? They couldn't go very, they could go fast because they could develop new gearing to get up to speed. By 1914, they were realizing they need a little more specialized car, and by 1916, this is a specialized racing car. Still two drivers, but they have wire wheels. The um, chain drive is gone and becoming a little more streamlined. The other thing on the 1916 car, that's uh, Eddie Rickenbacker at the wheel of a Delage racer. And on the hood of his car up there by the radiator, <laughs> the Cupid all. He was very superstitious. A lot of sports people are superstitious anyway. So was Eddie Rickenbacker. He became Captain Eddie Rickenbacker later, World War I flying ace and all of that. But he drove race cars initially. But that's a good bit of fun there with the Cupid all. So by 1919, you got down to very specialized race cars, special exhaust, and only one-man cars instead of two-man cars, the whole thing. And this was just in this one decade. They had developed it that, that far. If you wanted to win a race, you had to have a specialized vehicle. You couldn't just strip down your street car and go out and race and do that. So why would people want to race? Well, for this reason, you get big headlines. You can make yourself famous. Look at that. And why would the city want to do that? Well, because you can make yourself famous. And that's exactly why Santa Monica wanted the races to come out. Because when the new people were coming into the area, the big thing they want to do is go to a place that they've heard of. You know, if you go to Paris, for instance, you want to go see the Eiffel Tower. Why? We've heard of that. And then you start from there, you go other places and find other things and whatnot. But you find some place to start. And that's what the auto racing did. And that's why they would do that. You could get famous. The drivers could get famous, your car, you could, when Hanshu won in 1909, you could go down to the local Epperson dealer and buy essentially that same car. That day, you could go do that. The big red pennant, we, I have another one over there from 1914. Today you would go and get the event t-shirt. Back then it was a felt pennant. So uh, that's just how that worked. And they were colorized, mine, mine is faded out. So, why would you not want to race? Because this can happen. This is Eddie Puller. Wheel came off, obviously. He's at dead man's curve, so he did not die. Wheel came off, he slid into the corner, didn't damage his car too terribly bad. In fact, two days later, this is 1914, two days later, he came back and ran the American Grand Prize race in the very same car and won the race. So it didn't turn out too bad. Another thing to notice in the background, there's guys up in the pole just so they can watch the race. Why not? Hey, climb up there and watch. And these other guys on the left, they're all running for cover, of course, because that's pretty much what you would do in a case like that. Well, now, Poland wasn't the only guy to go over. This is John Marquis, turning turtle at Dead Man's Curve. Before he did not die. It's like the blanket thing. You can't die at Dead Man's Curve over there. So he's coming off of Ocean, coming towards me, turning onto Wilshire. He's going downhill on Ocean, so he makes this turn and did not negotiate it properly. One thing about this is, you look way off to the right, there's palm tree, and there's police officers standing out there protecting the course, keeping guys out of the way. And as you move across to the right, you find a guy standing over on the side. And he's standing there. What do you suppose he's doing? He's taking this picture. Think about that for a second. <laughs> Focal plane shutter, two different individuals, same precise moment they captured this instant in time. Arm is out, other arm is bent, arm is out, other arm. How did this happen? Two unrelated guys taking the same instant in time. 1914, again, focal plane shutter, the whole thing. <coughs> and as a research guy, when you come across something like that, you just fall over. You just, you just die. I can't believe this is true. And then you start looking at all the details and you, you try to find the other camera guy, and of course you can't, but you know, <coughs> oh, it's wonderful to find things like this. And there it was, Dead Minister. He came back to race again, of course. 
That's just terrific stuff. So here's the other side of the race course, San Vicente. Train tracks, which is now the green belt, and the road was to the left-hand side. Today, if you go out there, the road going towards the beach is on the north side of the green belt, and that's going towards the beach, and then you have segregated from the other cars that are coming the other direction. Okay, back then they only needed the one road. And they raced along that road. And you go into the S curve and you're going downhill, and it is not a dead man's curve. Therefore, you cannot. And in 1916, Lewis Jackson and the Mormon broke the steering gear, got out of control, hit the tree. You see how many trees there are in that image over there. That was well, they had a very cavalier attitude about racing drivers back in those days. If you crashed and died, we'd pass the hat, we'd all feel bad for you, but you knew the risk when you took it, right? And so we would do that. Well, you can't be killing the lemonade lady, and you can't kill the camera operator, and you can't have cars going apart and getting into it. So this was a big reason as to why racing on real roads, not just in Santa Monica, but across the country, had to go away, okay? And this was a big part of it. But they had really done their job by this time. So this was a tragic accident. I can't say that it was avoidable, but it was getting more crowded, the cars were getting faster, and it was getting just too dangerous. So they knew to get away from it. And they did. So here's Dario Resta, Pujol. Notice that 1909, the winning speed was 64 miles an hour. Just a few years later, they're running 90 miles an hour, half again as fast, with the specialized race cars. The cars were getting better, the drivers were getting better. Everything was happening for them. They were just getting faster and more dangerous. More people were coming to the area, and so that they were getting even bigger crowds. And they knew it had to come to an end. And so that's a big part of what happened there. Another thing that's fun about Resta is when he pulled in the pits, he got a bottle of milk. Requested that he got a bottle of milk, and the LA Times says he drank it to the dregs before dismounting, which is good fun. I like it because it happened in 1916, and the Indy 500 has a tradition of drinking milk when the guy wins the race, but that started in the 1930s. So this guy, here we were doing it, here we were, 20 years before. And I think that's kind of fun. That Cruzeau race car um, wound up in a private collection, the Buffalo collection, and it was over in the valley. And it was a very significant race car. I think it was the most significant race car in auto racing, in American auto racing. We can talk about that some other time. But uh, it was over there, it was nice, you got to see it. There it is. And uh, they didn't know they were driving in the past, and so they didn't have black and white cars, they had colorful cars. Of course they did. We don't see it that way. Everybody's various shades of gray. Like when I was a kid growing up, I thought all the football teams had a black uniform and a white uniform. You know, that's all I knew. Same thing here. And you can see the older cars, the yellow one's a Cadillac, there's a Simplex and a Pope Hartford. You can imagine those with carriage work and everything else on them, and that's what they raced originally. And they would strip all of that off so they wouldn't lose the parts as they're racing around. Of course, by the time the Peugeot came into play, you know, it was a very different game. They still have racers out there. Ragtime racers, they call themselves, and they travel around the country and they drive these old cars. And this happens to be a national, I know this man very well. I, borrowed, I had to borrow his car a couple times and do things with it. I went and picked up my daughters from school in it one time, which I thought was way cool. He doesn't loan me his car anymore, though, I don't call it. But anyways, so they do that. These cars are still around. It's still able to see them, and it's just fascinating to see that different sort of technology. Notice, for the mechanician, there's nothing to hold on to. And it's wide open. <laughs> it's, just a, it's a whole different sort of ballgame. You don't even have to go fast to scare yourself from those things. But they're just wonderful. All right, here we go. Wrap it up. Why do they want the auto races in Southern County, in Santa Monica in particular? Well, you can see the population of Santa Monica. Los Angeles was annexation crazy at this time. They were sucking up property all over the place. And then when the water came in in 1913, you got a nice little town there, you can buy water from us, or you can become part of us and we'll provide you with water. So therefore, they were able to annex more and more property. Santa Monica wanted to, be t wanted to stay autonomous from the city of Los Angeles. And the only way they could do that was by having large enough population base to be able to withstand that. They have their own water. There's an aquifer under Santa Monica now. 
And their population today is right around 87 to 90,000 people. And they're still able to provide 85% of their own water just from their own aquifer. So that was one of the ways they were able to do that. The other reason that auto racing was, was particular to this, and I, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, but when I did my research, it was in the 1990s, and the internet didn't exist. Well, if you go to the internet today, you, you log in, you punch up Barney Oldfield 1917, and you'll get all kinds of little articles and stories. Well, back then, I had to go to microfilm, and you find your article and whatnot. When you see your article, it's on the whole page. So you get not only the data and stuff that you're interested in, but you get it all in context. And that's what brought about this particular point of the racing being so important to Santa Monica itself. You throw it into the context of all the all the different political things that were going on at the time and why Santa Monica <coughs> needed these races to attract people <coughs> to that particular era, area. They could go anywhere in Southern California. And it chose Santa Monica because when the racers came out, their deal was we will grade and pave your roads that we race on. This way they can go faster, they can sell more cars, they can attract more attention, get more headlines. Right? When we're done racing, we'll make the roads smooth again and you can have them for the rest of the year because they only race once a year. Pretty good deal. Now the city didn't have to pave their roads. And where are you going to locate your business and your home? On the dirt roads or next to the paved road, which is paved road. So that's where Santa Monica benefited from the auto racing. Okay. Well, there we go. Much time is cool. <laughs> what happened was, I, I found that this was, was the most fascinating era for me because these guys just didn't know what they were doing. They, they were just ignorant because they just didn't know yet. And they were learning and they were finding their own way. Technology, organization, the whole bit. And it coincided with the development of Southern California in general. This particular era, <coughs> Santa Monica, the Vanderbilt Cup and American Prize races that I touched on earlier, those were the biggest races in the country at the time. The absolute biggest. And you had the biggest professional names out here, Ralph De Palma, Teddy Tesla, all these guys. And Indianapolis 500 hadn't really started up at this point, so that <coughs> didn't come into play until a little bit later. So everything happened right here. And it was a part of why Santa Monica is still Santa Monica instead of Santa Monica being a neighborhood of Los Angeles. We all live here and you cross the street and it's no big deal. But that's what happened. And there it is. I can open it up to questions. And uh, I know we're getting uh, kind of close to you guys being done with your lunch time, but uh, I appreciate you coming in. Yes?
the better technology at the time, and they were on the right hand side. And the Fiat race cars that we saw, those were French as well as the Peugeot, and so they would be on the right hand side of the car. There you go. That's kind of a long winded answer, but. You know. Thank you. Sure. Anything else? Yes, sir. Did any technology from after the First World War influence how they were building the cars? Did it advance it at all? From after after? Absolutely. But that blue car we saw in the end with uh, Dario Resta, um, the reason, and that was a French car, Peugeot, the figure, they had to smuggle it out of Germany just before World War I. This was 1913, 1914. And they smuggled it out because they knew the war was coming and it would be destroyed. They needed these smaller engines to power their aircraft. The big engines they were using prior to this time, 900 cubic inches, were just too hit, too big, too massive. Even if you could get your plane up in the air, the framework of the plane would break under the weight of these engines. So you needed to be able to turn more RPM, and they did that out of smaller pieces and more precision. So there's a whole reason why all that works. And they had to develop the machining techniques, the metallurgy, everything else to make that happen, and they did. But that was all war driven. They wanted to be able to fly their planes, and they needed a smaller, more powerful engine to do that, and that's where it came about. Yeah, it all ties together. And it's all fascinating stuff because it's just people that did this, you know, they had a need, they wanted to go out, and being young men, of course, I can run faster than you. Well, my horse is faster than yours. Well, now my car is faster than yours. And that's what young men do. They compete. Okay, go out there and do that. And that's what was going on with this type of car. And it was difficult. They had some races where women would run, um, not on the roads, typically on, on the horse tracks, and on the one-mile horse tracks, and they could do it. But it was, again, with the steering gear stuff, it was a direct line. It wasn't power steering like we have today. You can sit in there with one finger and turn your car. But back then, every bump, every rut, everything you hit would get directly fed back to the driver. So your arms and your body and everything, you'd be totally beat up. And it was not uncommon for these guys to come in after 300 miles of racing and just sit in their car for 10 minutes because they couldn't really move. Their hands were so tired from gripping the wheel, the bodies got beat up, and they had the big open exhaust, blah, 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 the whole time. So you'd be standing there telling them what a great ride he had, and hey, what'd you think that left 12, you know, and he's over there thinking. <laughs> That, and that's all they could do for a couple of days. They're here and they'd be so shot. Yes? Like I remember the um, the top 